are currently in school preparing for your turn, or as they sometimes say, your turn in the barrel, your turn at the helm. So uh, glad to have you with us. It's my pleasure and my honor to introduce from the United States Air Force Academy, Cadet Second Class, Christina McMillan. Good afternoon, everyone. Every single cadet who goes to the Air Force Academy knows the name Richard S. Ritchie. And even better, we have the pleasure of walking past his F-4 every single day. General Ritchie was a graduate from Viking 9 in 1964, and after that, he went to fly F-4s in Vietnam, where he shot down five MiG-21s, and he became the first and only Air Force ace in Vietnam. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce, who's better known as Cinco or Steve, <laughs> General Ritchie. Oh, one, two, three, four, five. There we go. Thank you very much, Chrissy. Uh, I spoke to your boss yesterday, General Stephen with a PH, same as mine, Williams. And uh, so I promised him that I would uh, keep an eye on you guys here to make sure you're upholding uh, all of those great standards um, and competing. Do we have the West Point and Annapolis and, and uh, VMI and how many others? Penn State. He beat the heck out of us when I was playing <laughs> football. In fact, that, that, that reminds me, General Cleveland, I sure am glad she didn't tell the score of that Air Force Carolina football game in the Gator Bowl of 63. Almost no one here in the room remembers that. I've been trying to forget it for 52 years now, this coming December. 28. I was a halfback out at the Air Academy. This last game took place against one of my home state teams, University of North Carolina. I thought that'd be the greatest way in the world in yet 11 years of organized football. Well, as tradition would have it, after the game, they gave us a watch. It had a little football and alligator in the middle of it. Every time I looked at mine, it read 35 to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that was the score of the ball game. Uh, now, that season was not a total loss. We, uh, we don't have any Nebraska fans here that would admit it, do we? Any big red fans? That's good, because you wouldn't like this story. We, oh no. <laughs> we, this little Air Force team, traveled Lincoln, Nebraska, the, uh, about mid-October, uh, the fall of 63, we were unranked. We didn't have a chance of being ranked. We're outweighed over 20, over 50, 50 pounds per person. Uh, Nebraska is undefeated and nationally ranked. We won that game in the last two minutes. Now think about it. To beat the Big Red in Lincoln when they're undefeated and in the top 10. We'd get out of town in a hurry. <laughs> Only game Nebraska lost, 63 season. They beat Auburn in the Orange Bowl. They ended up Number five in the nation, we denied them the national championship. Some people, some people like to applaud at this point. Yeah. Having, to, having to work for it again, Jim. Uh, so you see the impossible is sometimes possible, right? There was no way. We had absolutely no chance. It was totally impossible. Somehow we did it. The impossible is sometimes possible. And a great lesson for all of us. And so one of the many reasons that I'm happy to be with you today, April of 1972, I really shouldn't have made it. On my very first mission over Hanoi, 16 April, 72, there were three SAMs. A lot of you know that's a surface-to-air missile about the size of a telephone pole. They were accelerated our, up at our airplanes at what, about 15, 1,600 miles an hour? They would proximity fuse, detonate, and be lethal, be deadly within about 150 feet. And on my very first mission, three of them came within 100 feet of our airplane, failed to go off, failed to detonate. Thank goodness for that Soviet quality control, <laughs> would you agree? But there were many other times, and really had it not been for thousands and thousands of people, 
and the entire military and civilian support community who were proud of their work, who performed it in a professional, outstanding manner. Steve Ritchie would not be a fighter ace, and I probably would not be alive. So as you can imagine, I'm pretty thankful, pretty grateful. I feel very fortunate to receive so much of the credit that belongs to so many who helped to make it all possible. Many fighter pilots who could have done what I did. But we had a unique opportunity in the air combat arena. And there were some reasons for our success at the time, given that opportunity. And you know what they are. Preparation, teamwork, discipline, dedication, education, training, communication, enthusiasm, enthusiasm, Attitude, 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 will, determination, integrity. Surely most will agree that those are the elements, the ingredients, the keys that go into the makeup of what? Success, achievement, quality, excellence, top gun performance, and anything that we do, personal or professional. So in the final analysis, it's people and a wide array of support functions who are trained and motivated and ready and willing to do the job, who ultimately make it possible for us to win rather than to lose, to succeed rather than to fail, sometimes, sometimes to live rather than to die. That gets to be pretty important, doesn't it? General Patton said we fight with machinery, but we win with people. We win with people. I really am convinced that people can and will do great things. They'll reach for the stars when motivated by inspired leadership. I'd like to tell you for just a few minutes about three of the great leaders that I had the wonderful privilege to fly with and work for. The wing commander at Udorn, Thailand in 1972 was a young colonel named Charlie Gabriel. Ten years later, he was the chief of our Air Force. The vice wing commander was Jerry O'Malley. He became the vice chief. He was commander of Pacific Air Forces. Then commander of Tactical Air Command when he was tragically killed in an airplane accident in the spring of 1985. He would surely have been the chief. There was an Army One Star there with whom we worked. Began his career in the enlisted ranks of the Minnesota National Guard. Became chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. General Jack Vesey. These three people, these three individuals had that, I don't know what you call it, Chrissy. I talk about it so much, I don't want to name it. That special quality, I guess, that, that inspires the desire for excellence in almost everyone who's around them. You know people like that? We'd have done almost anything for Charlie Gable, Jerry O'Malley, Jack Vesey. And I know a lot of people find this next statement hard to understand. Some of you might, maybe you know it to be true. I would have died for them. So would many of my colleagues, and some did. Some did. It's a pretty special brand of loyalty, isn't it? Because I'll tell you what, there are a lot of people I don't feel that way about. A whole lot of people. What is it? Have you thought about it very much? What is it that commands such loyalty? Well, part of it is we admired them. We respected them. We loved them. We did. We'd have done almost anything for them. Yet maybe more important than anything else, we knew that loyalty cut both ways. We knew when things really got tight, when we got into a jam, into a bind, we could count on them just as much as they knew they could count on us. That loyalty cut both ways. And it's so important for us to think about what is it in others that inspires us to do our best and to be our best? And then try to be that way for those who look to us for leadership and guidance and counsel and inspiration. I like the author who wrote, I love you not only for what you are, but for what I am when I'm around you. 
for what I am when I'm around you. But you see, we were better people when we were around Charlie Gable, Jerry O'Malley, Jack Vesey. We did a better job. We worked harder, communicated better, more creative, more productive. You know what else? We had a heck of a lot more fun. Because it is fun to work with people like that, isn't it? Those of us in leadership and management and supervisory positions have such important responsibilities because we have either a very positive, a very mediocre, or a very negative effect on people and the lives of people. That's what? Performance, productivity, creativity, communication, bottom line mission accomplishment. And it's more important today than it's ever been, isn't it? When we need to be as productive as we can be, in most cases now with fewer resources. It's never been more important than it is right now. Bill Danforth, the founder of Ralston Purina, always used to challenge the people in his company to stand tall, to think tall, to smile tall, and to live tall. Aren't these the kind of people we have in the room here today? Why? Because you're up, you're proud, you're happy, you're courteous, you're creative. You communicate better. You like to work. I know. I know it's a new concept in many quarters these days, isn't it? Unfortunately. You like to work in that spirit. That spirit is contagious. In the score for Vagabond King, Rudolph Crummel wrote, Give me ten who are stout-hearted, and soon I'll give you ten thousand more. That spirit contagious. Now many ask about the 8th of July 1972 when we downed two MiG-21s in a minute and 29 seconds, seconds because it's such a great example of how all of the elements of the team effort come to produce an incredible victory. Well the last thing that happened that morning before we taxied is the crew chief came up the ladder to let me know we didn't have any film for the camera. We were an F4E model with a gun and a gun camera. Most of the time I was in the D model without a gun camera. I said, what do you mean, Chief? There's no film. He said, we're out of film. There's no film on base. Thought about that for a moment. I said, I guess that's okay. I doubt we'll see MiGs today anyway. See, we never know, do we? It's another good lesson. Because we never know what's just around the corner. You never know what's just over the horizon. And that's why it's so important to be as prepared as we can possibly be in every area in our lives because we never know and we need to be ready. And whether we like it or not, whether the main media likes it or not, whether Republicans and Democrats and conservatives and liberals like it or not, whether high school teachers and college professors like it or not. You well know we're in combat. And it's a war of good versus evil, right versus wrong, freedom versus slavery, civilization versus chaos. And we must not fail. You must not fail. Think about the fact that Tens of millions of young people right now all over the world are being taught to hate us and to kill us, to convert us, or to eliminate us. Ladies and gentlemen, you must not fail. Now to lighten it up just a little bit, uh, it was a time when the French and the English were at war. And the French captured this English major and took him to the headquarters to be questioned by the French general. So the general's asking this English major, now I need a little help here. Anybody speak British? All right, I'll try it. The French general says, why do you English officers all wear those red coats? But you know it makes it an easier target. He says, well, sir, <laughs> we wear those red coats because if we're shot, 
the blood won't show and the men whom we're leading won't panic. And from that day forward, all French army officers have worn brown pants. <laughs> Chatfield, I never have been able to get it straight. Is, uh, is the uh, Navy a part of the Marines? A dear friend, Bill Chatfield, from days way back in the Reagan administration. You know, I did have a chance to fly with one of these Marines one time. We got some bad weather. We had to make an instrument approach into the field. We finally broke out under the weather. He tried to land on a runway that was 150 feet long, 10,000 feet wide. <laughs> a little trouble getting it stopped. Of course, the Marines believe they can do it, don't they? Even when they're not in a hurry. <coughs> Our friends in the Navy do it every day. It's a matter of course. By the way, it was here about three years ago that I was so honored to receive the Joe Ronnie Hooper Award. Hooper, thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very special. How's our time? Minutes. All right, we're going to take 10. Okay. <laughs> sir, yes, sir. Yeah. I was going to tell you about one of the great rescue missions of all time, the Roger Locker rescue mission, because it proves that the impossible is indeed possible. If you're interested, it's on YouTube under the Locker, Roger Locker, L-O-C-H-E-R, rescue. Takes me about seven or eight minutes, but more importantly, Mariana grew up under communism in Romania, dreaming of what it would, like, would be like to be free. She understands freedom from a perspective that very few people in our country do, and she's going to take 10 minutes and tell you about it. At first sight, I'm just a general's little wife, but beyond that, I am the oppressed that you rescued and the American who fights alongside you every day to keep our freedom from slipping through our fingers. I come from Romania, a communist Romania and an oppressed Romania. While American children were learning to um, love and trust themselves, we learned to hate, trust no one, control every word we said because our life depended on it. We had to wait in line for hours, even days, for a piece of bread. The communists believed in spreading the wealth, take it from the ones who have and give to the poor. That paralyzed the economy because the ones who had didn't want to work anymore when it was all taken away. And the poor didn't want to work because they were getting something for nothing. And that only lasted until they ran out of other people's money, which it happens really fast. Guns were illegal because unarmed people are a lot easier to control and oppress. Knowing that my grandfather was a priest, we were threatened with all kinds of things for going to church. And that only made us go to church more. And it was not courage, it was despair. We wanted to provoke them and make them come after us, do whatever they wanted to do, and get it done and over with. We couldn't say Merry Christmas, we had to say Happy Holidays. We couldn't say Christmas trees, we had to say Holiday Trees. The socialist healthcare killed many. Supposedly free, it was not. Nothing is ever free. One of my first memories as a child was holding the hand of a dying man who was a neighbor and a friend, and my grandmother crying, saying, there's nothing more we can do for him, just help him die. I can still feel his hand getting cold and stiff in my hand, and I remember thinking how quickly it happens. And the look of death in his eyes is still haunting me. When I asked my grandmother how old I was, she said I was five years old when this happened. 
all he needed was a simple surgery, which here in America is an outpatient surgery. And he was left to die, waiting in line for months. Through all this madness, we felt forgotten even by God at times. But there was one constant hope that never left us, and that was the hope that American troops are going to come and blow us up. Blow up every board, every rock, every wall until there was nothing left standing because we felt we were not worth saving because we were part of a system that was so evil and so corrupt. As a little girl, I did not dream of Prince Charming coming on a white horse to carry me off to his castle. I knew I needed a lot more than that. I needed an American fighter pilot. That would come and blow up everything and then fly me off to America in a fighter jet. And I'm the luckiest woman alive to have found him and be able to spend the rest of my life with him. Coming to America, by the time I, I got to America, I was not dead, but I've never really been alive either. I was numb. I remember, and I will never forget this, um, flying into New York and the New York skyline with a Statue of Liberty and uh, the Twin Towers. And I, I kept it together cold and hard through 20 years of communism because you couldn't show weakness and emotion. But I broke down looking at, at New York. And we couldn't land right away, and the, the airplane had to circle. And here we are flying away from New York. And I thought, oh no, I really truly believed the communists to be as evil as to fly us there only to fly, take us right back. And I was not going to go back under communism. So I unbuckled my seatbelt and looked at the exit door, the emergency exit door, and if the airplane wasn't gonna turn back to New York, I was gonna jump because I'd rather be dead in America than live under oppression ever again. And New York was everything I thought it was going to be, and more. Um, the skyscrapers, all shiny, uh, steel and marble and glass, um, the fancy cars, the abundant food, um, the, the jewelry. I haven't seen diamonds till I went to New York. Um, the shoes <laughs> uh, and the clothes. And I had nothing. I couldn't afford anything. I didn't have a penny. I didn't even know what a penny looked like because there was no internet. Um, and we were not bitter at all. And we were not envious either. We were happy and proud to be a small part of a country that can make such wondrous things. And all those things were a promise that someday we can have all that. And now we do in, in the most amazing ways. We came to America with a bag of clothes. We didn't speak the language. I was 20 years old. And I was an outcast in my own country. And you took us in. And you gave us a second chance to life. And you taught us the meaning of new words like trust and kindness and love and honor and gave us everything we could ever possibly have and now I am proud to say that I am living the American dream dream I have it all in the most amazing ways and the reason I'm saying that is because you speak the language you're born here you have support you've got it all you can have it all we were born to have it all the worst form of oppression is the one from your own people, your own government. Why? Because it's really hard to identify, because it's disguised as your friend. We're doing this, we're taking away your freedom because we're trying to protect you, because we're there for you. Don't fall for that. You have the power. And let's get one thing straight, we the people, created and built 
our country, the greatest country in the world, because, let me repeat that, America is the greatest country in the world, and I don't care whose feelings that hurts. <laughs> we not only built our country, in spite of what they're trying to tell us that we didn't build our country, <laughs> but we also created our government. The government did not create us. We, the people, existed before the government. So the government is here for us. We're not here for the government. You have the power. The power is inside you. If you want uh, answers to your questions, don't look outside. Don't look at anybody else. Go look yourself in the eyes. You have the power. It's inside you. Don't give it away to anybody. You can do and be anything you want to. And real quick, one last thing. I had a picture of the American flag when I was under communist. And at times, in order to stay sane and not go crazy, I would take it out and just stare at it and dream of America and dream what about walking in Central Park and I would do it to the point to where I could almost hear the birds. I could also almost smell the flowers in Central Park. I would put so much passion in it, and I would imagine what a hamburger tastes like, or cheesecake. And now I have it all. The, the point I'm trying to make is, is picture what you want. Feel it like you already have it, and you will make it happen because you have the power. Vietnam was not in vain. I know you hear lots of negative things about Vietnam. With every move our troops, ma American troops made in Vietnam, we behind the Iron Curtain felt the Soviet grip lose its strength and it gave us time to breathe and, and stay alive. Because you kept the Soviets busy in Vietnam, they lost track of us. And there's no more even imp evil empire thanks to you. The world's a better place because America is in it. And yes, some government hate us, so what? Take it as a compliment. And now I'd like to give you the point of view of the oppressed. The oppressed does not look at Americans as rich or poor, black or white, Republican or Democrats. All the, the world cares about is Americans' rescuers. We're all one. United we stand. It's in the great seal of United States. It's right there, right in front of us. Don't forget that. We're all one. And in the name of the oppressed people all over the world, I'd like to thank you for all the sacrifices you've made for everything you've done, you're doing, and you will be doing for our country. It does make a difference. <laughs> God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you very, very much. Quite a legacy for all of us to live up to. We carry a big burden. You carry a big burden. The good news is you're up for the job. We're going to now uh, turn in this vision to really what's in front of us, what we're dealing with these days. Who's out on the front lines now? So I hope that we have, I'm looking for my panelists for this next session.